Hello everybody, welcome to the Voice of Faith. Having your Bibles this morning, I'd like for you to turn with me please to the book of John chapter 11 and welcome to part 4 in our series, The Glory of God. I was talking to my wife the other day. I am aware that when the Lord has us do a series, it's for a reason, that there's something that He wants to say, something He's really wanting to get across. And so, in fact, Brother Bill just brought in part three, so all, all, all the parts of the Glory series are out there in the back. I'm aware that God is wanting to say something, and so coming into this series on the glory, I think I mentioned that I have like 11 or 12 messages on the glory of God, and I thought we were going to do all of them. And the Lord surprised me, and He said, today's the last message on this series. And it's like, okay. <laughs> he said, because I thought we were going to do the whole thing. And he said, you're going to do it in, in small bites throughout the year. So that's the way we're going to do it, all right? We want to obey Him, amen? amen? He knows what's best. John chapter 11, verse number 1. This is our foundation text we're using for this series. John 11, verse 1. Now, a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And then we skip down to verse number 40. Verse 40 says, Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe thou shouldest see the glory of God. So we have some people here today that haven't been with us in the past. So let me just ask you this. Is there a connection between our faith and the glory of God in manifestation? There is. There is. And just as we have learned to actively release our faith for revelation knowledge and for other things, it's time for us to learn how to actively release our faith for the glory of God. God wants His church back. God wants to show up. He wants to reveal His glory. He wants to manifest His presence in His church. But in order for that to happen, he has to have people that love him, people that are hungry for him, and people that are actively believing for a manifestation of his glory. Amen. Amen. And I'm hungry for the glory, and I know you are too. And we're releasing our faith and believing for manifestations of the glory of God, whether it be a cloud, a wind, rain, fire, oil. It doesn't matter. However he wants to show up and whatever he wants to do, we're ready to receive it. Amen. It's God's idea to reveal his glory to us. It wasn't man's idea, it's his idea. And I'm so thankful that it's his heartbeat to reveal his glory to us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So if we're going to experience the glory, if you see me shaking, I'm not nervous. <laughs> Hallelujah. I may have to run some of this off. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If we're going to experience the glory, I wish you could be in my shoes right now, or beast cowboy boots. I'm shaking like crazy. <laughs> Hallelujah. If we're going to experience the glory, we must believe. Our faith and the glory are tied together. Jesus said, if you believe, you will see. Amen. How many of you know that believing comes before seeing? Amen. We don't see first and then believe. We believe first and then we see. Amen. 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 And just I'll throw this in real quick. We talked about this our, our last time. That sickness does not glorify God. Amen. Death does not glorify God. Healing and being raised from the dead glorifies God. Jesus said to them, if you, if you would believe, you would see. Future tense, you would see the glory of God. Well, they didn't see the glory of God when Lazarus was sick. They didn't see the glory of God when Lazarus was dead. They saw the glory of God when he was raised from the dead. Amen. Right? So sickness and disease does not glorify God. If sickness and disease glorified God, then sin would have to glorify him because sickness and disease is the result of sin. Amen? Amen? It's crazy to think, well, sin glorifies God. We know better than that. Well, if sin doesn't glorify him, then all of, the, all of the results of sin doesn't glorify him either. Don't shout me down now because I'm preaching good. <laughs> Amen. Good. Hallelujah. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. We are at a turning point. Amen. We are at a turning point. I want to give you the definition of the word turning point. According to Noah Webster... He says a turning point is a point in which a significant change occurs. A point at which 
a significant change occurs. We are at a turning point. Something is about to shift. And when it shifts, it will never shift back. Oh, hallelujah. We are about to experience a shift. And when it happens, we will never be the same again. The devil nor us could go back to what God is about to do. We are at a turning point. Ever since January 1, my spirit, man, has been, it's like a, a pot of water under, under, uh, on top of a fire. Man, it's just bubbling. I'm, I cannot settle down on the inside. The glory of God is about to break forth in this church and in his church for anybody who's hungry and believing for it. We have entered into a season of suddenlies. Hmm. We, oh yeah, we are entering into a season of suddenlies. Check out the definition of sudden. It means happening without previous notice. <laughs> One day you're going to wake up like this, and the next day you're going to wake up totally different. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> happening without previous notice. Hasty. Here's my favorite. Sooner than expected. Ha, ha, ha. Sooner than expected. We have entered into a time, a season of suddenlies. Things are going to happen sooner than we expected them to. Mm, mm, mm. I can't hold my paper. I'm shaking so much. Sooner than expected. Here's another one. Without premeditation. And the last one, quickly. Anybody here ever had a, have a suddenly in your life? Yeah. About a year and a half ago, I woke up in the morning, went into the, the kitchen area to have breakfast. I'm standing at the table, and I, could, and I had no idea this was going to happen. I could feel God take out of me all desire for coffee and soda. Just, I, I actually saw it leave. And about three seconds later, the Holy Spirit said, do not frustrate the grace of God. I had a suddenly. Wasn't praying for it. Wasn't looking for it. It just happened. I had a suddenly. And for a year and a half, I've been free of coffee and soda. I'm not saying that's God's will for you. It's just for me. All right? I used to drink a two-liter bottle of Dr. Pepper every day. Every day. First thing in the morning, I'd reach for a Dr. Pepper. Last thing at night, I'd have a Dr. Pepper. I was a pepperholic. I was. I was addicted. I'm free. No desire. Hallelujah. Year and a half and go I'm a steward of that grace. I'm waiting for my next suddenly to show up. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So you can have my coffee and you can have my Dr. Pepper because I'm good. We're at a turning point. We are at a turning point. Something's about to shift. It'll never be the same. We've entered into a season of suddenlies. Things are going to happen sooner than expected. You're going to get a phone call and your life will never be the same. You're going to meet somebody at the grocery store. Your life will never be the same. God's going to show up in your bedroom, and you're going to never be the same. Amen? You're going to go in your kitchen. There's a choir of angels singing. You'll never be the same again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Should I cut and run? <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go to Isaiah 59. I'll try and release this anointing through my, hand, through my mouth and not my feet. So you'll be blessed. Isaiah 59. Many years ago, I was married and had a little boy. Got a phone call from Wisconsin. And this pastor up there said, there's a church up here needing a pastor. And I think you ought to come and try out. He said, it's your kind of church. Because <laughs> he was in our kind of church. <laughs> I won't go into all that. But anyway, it's, it's your kind of church. He said, I think you ought to come up here and try out. I hung up the phone and I knew that was my church. I knew. So I left Granite City, Illinois, went up to Black River Falls, Wisconsin. Cost me 50 cents because I bought a can of Dr. Pepper. <laughs> this was 30-something years ago, all right? <laughs> Close to 40 years ago. Anyway, so I uh, went up there, preached one time. Another time, I was staying at a deacon's house. It was cold up there, a lot of snow. 
January 1st, 1986, I was announced pastor of Black River, Fall, Black River Falls Bible Church. Full-time, had my own office, had a big, beautiful building, lots of acreage, and I was there. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, son, you'll not be up here more than two years. This is training ground for you. I was there for one year, 11 months, and three weeks. <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. Isaiah 59, verse 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and His glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Last part of that verse. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. A flood comes in waves, wave after wave after wave. And a flood is out to do one thing. It's out to bring damage, right? Amen. The flood strategy of Satan is to leave a wake of destruction to make debris out of God's people. I'll say that again. The flood strategy of Satan. How many of you know he has a flood strategy? Wave after wave after wave. And here's the, here's the sad part. So many Christians don't know that they're in a spiritual attack until later on. They're so spiritually dull, they don't catch the first wave as something's up. They're so spiritually dull that they don't even hear the Spirit of God telling them before the first wave hits. They're four or five waves into it, and then they realize, you know, something might be going on here. <laughs> right? My kids got sick, refrigerator broke, and I lost my job all in 10 days. Hmm. Might be an attack. The, the flood strategy of Satan is to leave a wake of destruction to make debris out of God's people. You know it and I know. We've all experienced it, haven't we? I'm looking at mature people in here. We've all experienced the flood of the enemy. My, my father in the faith calls it the pile-up technique. Just one thing after another after another because he wants to break you down. Right? I told you that the number one reason why people quit God and quit church is because they stop believing He's faithful. Why else would you quit? If you believe that God's faithful, that He hears and answers prayer, you won't quit. You won't give up. But as soon as you think He stops answering prayers, as soon as you start believing that He's not faithful, you're going to give up. He wants that one more straw on the camel's back to break it. The flood strategy of Satan is to leave a wake of destruction to make debris out of God's people. There is no saint, weak or strong, who goes unnoticed by the destroyer. Everyone in here, the devil has watched you. He's looked at you. He's aware of us. Amen. Anybody who claims Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, you're a target. He hates you with a passion. No need to be afraid. Because when he comes in like a flood... What's the Spirit of the Lord do? Lifts up the standard, right? The standard the Spirit lifts up is the shed blood of Jesus. This is the standard. Just think about it. The blood of Jesus is our standard. And this is the standard He lifts up against the onslaught of the devil because as I told you before, this is the one thing that the devil has no weapons against. He cannot come against the blood of Jesus. He can come against the Word. We know that from the parable of the sower sowing seed. But when it comes to the blood, He has nothing to resist that precious blood. Amen. And so that's the one thing the Spirit of God lifts up is the blood of Jesus so we can have the victory. I am convinced with all my heart between now and the rapture of the church, the primary weapon for the church will be the blood of Jesus. Amen. It'll be the primary weapon for us. Amen. <clears throat> Let's go to Exodus, please. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus 12 and 13. Exodus 12 and 13. 
<clears throat> the Lord told me a few weeks ago, only the blood of Jesus can prepare you for the glory. Only the blood of Jesus can prepare you for the glory. Prayer and fasting should be a response to what the blood has done. You take the blood of Jesus out of the equation, prayer and fasting is nothing more than works of the flesh. Amen. Only the blood can prepare you for the glory. There are certain things that only the blood can do. There's things the name can do, there's, name, there's things the word can do, there's things the Holy Spirit can do, but there's some things only the blood can do, and only the blood can prepare you for the glory. Exodus 12 and 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the house. Let's read that part again. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. It is a personal matter. The blood shall be for you a token. You can believe in the blood. You can value the blood. But it will do you no good until you apply the blood. Amen. It must be a personal matter. Blood must be applied if it's going to count. You can, see song, you can sing songs about the blood, and I think we should. But until you apply it to your life, it won't do you any good. It is a matter of personal application. But once you learn to apply it, once you, you, you learn the value and the worth and the power of that blood, you will honor it even more. You will sing songs about it even more. <laughs> Hallelujah. God promised his people that when he saw the blood, he would deliver them. God will keep his part of the covenant. Our responsibility is to sprinkle the blood. His responsibility is to deliver. Hmm. Wheels be a turning. How do we apply the blood? How do we sprinkle the blood? By confession. By confession. In the name of Jesus, I sprinkle the blood of Jesus on my wife. Amen. I sprinkle the blood on our marriage. I sprinkle the blood on this building. I sprinkle the blood on you. I'm confessing. I'm sprinkling that blood by my words. Amen. And we plead the blood. We plead it. We use it. Lord, bring that back to my mind. Please. Uh -huh. You plead the blood, you rest your case. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you for bringing that back to me. When you plead the blood, you rest your case. <laughs> exhibit A. <laughs> and we only have one exhibit because it's all we need, the blood. Right? <laughs> Who'd you say, would say this after me? Say, in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood to the Father. Rest I rest my case. In the name of Jesus, I sprinkle the blood on my life. I am the redeemed. Satan, you can't touch this. Dun, 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 dun. Can't touch this. Right? Can't touch this. Why? The blood. The blood. We are to apply the blood outwardly. And we are to receive the blood inwardly by drinking it through communion. Amen. The blood within, the blood without. We are untouchable. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It will be the primary weapon for us in these last days. Galatians chapter 5, please. How are we doing? You get anything out of this? Good. Thank you, Jesus. Galatians 5. Aren't you thankful for the blood? How precious is the blood of our redemption. Hmm. We talked in our series on the blood about, and we, we entitled it, The Precious Blood of Jesus. 
because Peter called it precious blood. How can you place a value on the blood? We really can't, but I'm going to give you a biblical way to get some idea of the value of that blood. Think about every single animal shed in the Old Covenant for the covering of their sins. All the sheep, all the oxen, thousands of years, millions of animals, blood was shed. And that was just a type of what the anti-type, the anti-type, the blood of Jesus, its value, its worth for us. There's no human language that could describe the full value and the worth of that blood. Amen? In Galatians 5, verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We are required, brothers and sisters, to resist what we have been delivered from. People are writing that down. We are required to resist what we have been delivered from. This is the suffering we're called to. This is our suffering. There's a suffering involved in resisting what the devil would try to bring to us. We're going to use that blood. We're going to use it in faith. But there is a stand of faith. There is the good fight of faith. And our suffering is in resisting the pressure the enemy would bring to us. How many here has ever been tempted? Everybody? Really? Not just me. Well, how about that? Do you know what a, a scratchy sore throat is? It's a temptation to get sick. You can either accept it, and get full-blown whatever, or you can resist that scratchy throat. Wrecking it, recognizing it for what it is. It's a temptation to accept more. You resist that in the name of Jesus. Sprinkle the blood of Jesus on your throat and resist. We are required to resist what we've been delivered from. Hebrews chapter 10, please. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. And verse 19. It's 1035. We're having a spiritual breakfast. <laughs> Y'all want to go out for coffee? I'll go out with you and watch you drink it. I'll have a cup of hot tea. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness... To enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. How do we enter the holiest place? By the blood of Jesus, right? And we come boldly because of that blood. The holiest place is the glorious place. The holiest place is the glorious place. The word holiest lets us know that there are some places that are not as holy as others. Right? Right? No wonder why we go from glory to glory. Because the glory of God is the outshining of His holiness. It's the beauty of His holiness. And as we learn to grow in holiness or walk in holiness, the greater the glory manifests. So the blood gives us access to the holiest place. That same blood gives us access to the glorious place. God will honor no man who doesn't live holy. That's sobering, isn't it? It's true. God will honor no man who doesn't live holy. Righteousness is the key to holiness. Awake to righteousness and sin not, the Bible says. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter, to enter, to enter, to enter, what happened in the Old Covenant? with Solomon, all of those sacrifices, and the glory of God came in like a cloud, and the Bible says it was so strong the priests weren't able to stand. 
Moses. All the sacrifices and the tent of meeting and the glory of God came down and it was so thick and so strong the Bible says the priests weren't able to stand. You want to know where being slain in the spirit was at? There it is. They fell out under the power of God. They couldn't stand because of the glory. But this says that we enter in. That's how strong and powerful the blood is. Our blood is our access to the glory. They couldn't stand. We're going to run into it. We're going to get in there and we're going to live in the glory because of the blood. What the blood of animals could not do, the blood of Jesus secured for us. Hallelujah. Hobby, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to love the service when the, when the cloud is so thick you can't see me and I can't see you. All we can do is hear each other, but we can't see each other. How you doing over there, Nelson? Wonderful, Pastor. How are you? Enjoying the Lord. Hallelujah. We'll crawl out later. <laughs> I'm not just a preacher who's happy. I'm telling you scripture. Amen. We are going to enter in boldly because of that blood. Amen. Hallelujah. Read with me, please, in the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Of course, an excited preacher is better than a dead preacher. <laughs> what? No amens on that? <laughs> Just a bunch of laughs, huh? <laughs> I'll see you after church. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's great. We're in a morgue. <laughs> For those of you listening and don't know, we're meeting in a funeral home, all right? <laughs> we're not in a morgue morgue like we're dead. But people are dying to get into the voice of faith. <laughs> Revelation chapter 1. It's a wild, this is like a Wednesday night service, man. This is wild woolly today. <laughs> Revelation 1.5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 6 again. And hath made us kings and priests unto God. So because of the blood of Jesus... Not only have we been forgiven and not only have we been cleansed, but we have been made priests, we've been made kings and priests unto God, right? Those are two very important roles. And for us, our greatest ministry is not to each other. Our greatest ministry is to Him. And that's the priesthood ministry been given to every believer. Every child of God is called into the priesthood ministry to offer up sacrifices of praise to the Lord. Right? Your most important ministry is to worship Him and minister to Him. And your ministry to Him, as that grows and develops, then your ministry to people grows and develops. Amen. But your first ministry is not to people. Your first ministry, you're called to Him. Amen. Right? Okay, now this is important with the blood and the glory. Let's look at something uh, interesting concerning this. All the way back to Leviticus 8. We like to travel around in our Bibles here at the Voice of Faith. Leviticus 8 and 30. <clears throat> How many of you realize the Lord needs ministering to? Amen. He's got to put up with 7 billion people, 7 billion knuckleheads. That guy needs to be ministered to. <laughs> Amen. I can't remember who it was in the Old Testament, some king. The Bible says that God was displeased with him and things went bad for him. And the, the Bible says the reason why was because he didn't give thanks because of the goodness that was rendered to him. It's like God gave him, I'm just throwing this out, God gave him 100% goodness and he rendered 10% thanks. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 28 that the curse comes on us when we're not thankful. It's important that we minister to the Lord. Leviticus 8, Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 30. And Moses took of the anointing oil. What does that represent? 
The, the anointing oil represents what? The Holy Spirit. Okay, thank you. And of the blood. Moses took of the anointing oil and of the blood, which was upon the altar, and sprinkled it upon Aaron, and upon his garments, and upon his sons, and upon his son's garments with him, and sanctified Aaron and his garments, and his sons and his son's garments with him. What was Moses doing? He was inaugurating the priesthood. It was a, it's coming into effect. And so Moses sprinkled both the anointing oil and the blood on Aaron, his sons, and on their garments. The spirit and the blood are inseparable. The spirit and the blood are inseparable. When you find one, you will find the other. The spirit and the blood are inseparable. When you find one, you're going to find the other. We've said it like this in the past. The blood was poured out at Calvary so the spirit could be poured out at Pentecost. The Spirit answers to the blood. The Spirit answers to the blood. And that's why the Holy Spirit lifts up that standard against the enemy. And that standard is the blood of Jesus. So the, blood, the Spirit and the blood are inseparable. Man-made programs and slick advertisement are no substitute for the glory. I read this recently. I want to read it again. The church has missed its greatest method of advertising. God's method of advertising was and is through healing and miracles. How many chickens have given their life to the gospel? We're going to have fried chicken dinners. Come on out. Sell all your rummage. We don't want your rummage. I got enough of my own rummage. No chicken should have died for the cause of Christ. His sacrifice was good enough. But we have lost the glory and we've gotten chicken dinners and pot pies and this and that and come on out and bring your rummage. Come join our baseball game. Come, come join our league. Come on out. we got all these kind of programs. But the glory is nowhere to be found. Everybody say amen. amen. Go with me please to Psalm 127. We're just about to close here. The Lord wants me to say th something, and I've got to figure out how He wants me to put this in and where to put it in. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Lord. We'll do it right here. Psalm 127, verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord builds the house, there will be no glory in the house. Unless the Lord builds the house, there will be no glory in the house. This is heavy. You ready? Are you ready? Amen. God's desire for us is to be a presence-based church. Most churches are gift-based. God's desire for us is to be a presence-based church. Most churches are gift-based. You have a gift, you have a talent, you have some anointing, we're going to put you in that place. Got that place taken care of. Three months later, somebody comes in, a little bit younger, a little bit better looking, has the gifts, the talents, the anointing for that same position, we're going to take you out and put somebody else in. And there are people in church that have been hurt and they're out wandering around. They have no home church, they have no pastor because they've been hurt because they've been done wrong, because they got involved in the church that was based, their whole operation is based on gifts. So they used that person for a while. Somebody came in better. We're going to get rid of you and put somebody else in place. 
And the vast majority of churches are gift-based, and God desires a church that's glory-based. I'll tell you right now, if you get a position in this church, and somebody younger, prettier than you comes in, better at that, don't worry, your place is secure. This is not corporate America. This is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not to treat the church like corporate America. We're going to climb up a ladder and be successful, and we're looking for the next best thing to come in that's prettier and better anointed. God desires for His church to be glory-based, to be presence-based. That would change the complexity of everything, wouldn't it? Now, I'm going to... Oh, sometimes being a pastor <laughs> is fun, and sometimes you got to get out the paddle. Whew. I'm going to say it because I'm going to be obedient. There is mass confusion in the church. Mass confusion in the church. And so many people have been hurt because you have people in, involved in the church and they think, I'm going in. God's called me to go into this church, and I'm going to help change the pastor. I'm going to help change the leadership, and I'm going to change this church, and I'm going in because I'm more mature than they are, and I'm going to help them. Listen to me. If you are a tongue-talking Christian, God did not send you into a Baptist church to change it. God did not send you into a Lutheran church or a Methodist church if you are a tongue-talking Christian, you belong in a church where the pastor and the leadership believes in speaking in tongues. If you believe in healing and the anointing of oil and the laying on of hands, God did not call you to go to a church that doesn't believe in healing and you're going to change the pastor and change that church. Never has happened, never will happen. And I've got scripture for it. Let's go to Ephesians. The Lord wants me to deal with this. There are people in churches and they're in the wrong church. Ephesians 4, if you are more mature than your pastor and the church leadership, you are in the wrong church. If you are more mature than your pastor and that church's leadership, you're in the wrong church. I see you growing spiritually. That keeps me on my toes. In order for me to be, to be the leader and the pastor, I've got to know God more than you do. I've got to know Scripture more than you do. I've got to walk with Him closer than you do, or I don't qualify to be your pastor. People go into a church, and they mean, well, well I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to change. Listen, if you don't agree with your pastor, you don't agree with what they're teaching, and you're in there to change, you're wrong. And here's the Scripture. Ephesians 4. Look at this. Huh. Man, verse 11, he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto, a, uh, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Maturity comes from headship down. It doesn't come from the church to the headship. Amen. If you're more mature than your church, you need to leave that church. You need to go someplace where the pastor there is more mature than you are, more mature than you are so he can help bring you up higher. Amen. God never calls anybody to go to a church to change it because their doctrine is different. Amen. Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. If the Lord doesn't build, there will be no glory in the house. People are building the house with their gifts, their abilities, their talents, their smarts. But God's not building the house. And therefore, there's no glory. There's just anointing. Don't build your life on anointing. Build your life on the glory. Amen. Amen. That went down well. Amen. I know this by my spirit. Somebody's going to be listening to this driving down the road, and they're going to go, uh-oh, <laughs> that was for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. John 14, please. We close with this. It's great to go to church. You just need to be in the right one. John 14. 
Don't put your money in a place where they preach something you don't believe. John 14, 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. You will hear people say, well, and I've had people tell me this, well, I worship the Lord in my own way. You ever heard that one? I worship the Lord in my own way. I love the Lord in my own way. I don't need church. I don't need to go. You know, there's hypocrites there. There's hypocrites at Walmart. You go there. There's hypocrites at the gas station. You go there. They're everywhere. So you might as well go to church with them. Right? Well, you know, I just, I love the Lord in my own way, and I worship the Lord in my own way. There's a big problem with that. And that is this. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. Not to, not to go down the wrong road here. I, I want to keep this the right way. But just, it's just so simple. Whether it be in a marriage or in a friendship, you want people to love you the way you want to be loved. Have you ever heard of the five love languages? Right? A woman's love language is different than a man's. Don't, if I don't know that, I'm going to love her the way I want to be loved. And I'm going to pour out my love to her. And she's going to go, you don't love me. What do you mean I don't love you? Look what all I do for you. Her love language is different than mine. So she tries to love me the way I love her. She go, I go, you don't love me. What do you mean you don't love me? Yeah, you don't love me. You get the point? Jesus has a love language. You can't just love him any way you want to love him. You can't just worship him in any way you want to worship him. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. That's his love language. There are times I'll go to bed and my wife will come in there and she'll just give me the best back rub, the best shoulder rub. I'm like, oh man, I'm so ready to go to sleep now. <laughs> she knows I like that. Right? Amen. Don't touch my feet. Don't. She hasn't touched my feet in years. Why? Because I spaz out. Don't tell me any secrets and then tickle my feet. I'll give them up, man. My feet are super sensitive. She doesn't touch my feet. She rubs my back and shoulders. Right? You've got to find out his love language. And his love language is obey me. If you love me, you'll obey me. Now, here's the thing. Some people love Jesus more than others. Some people love him more. Some people love him less. He said, if you love me, you'll obey me. Amen. Not everybody loves him. Obedient people are a treasure to God. Amen. Obedient people are a treasure to God. <laughs> Did you ever stop to think about this? The very worst thing that could ever happen to you to obey God, the very worst thing is that you would be blessed. How can you lose by obeying Him? The worst thing that could happen to you is you'll be blessed. But God considers us a treasure. We're special to Him when we obey Him. Now, here's the deal. I haven't left the glory. I did all that to say this to you. About the glory of God coming in this church or some other church, if we don't get rid of our time restraints, we're going to miss out on God. If we don't get rid of our time restraints, we're going to miss God. We will not see the strongest manifestations of the glory when we're wanting to rush out of service. God's biggest problem with His children right now is that they will not give Him the time that He so greatly desires. That's his number one problem, is we won't give him the time. I heard about a pastor who said, the day he took the clock down from, from the, they had a clock up on the wall behind him, so the whole congregation was listening to him, but they were looking at the clock. He said, the day he took down the clock, the glory of God came in. <laughs> We've got to give God the time he desires. So many people want to treat God like a, a big God. We're going to drive through Pick up our Mick healing. Pick up our Mick prosperity. Pick up our Mick revelation and God will see you next week. Bzz, here we go. Give him 45 minutes at max. Instant. Instant healings. This is coming up out of my spirit. Instant healings come when you take time to bake. <laughs> if you just bake, 
So many people are marinated. Is that how you say the word? Marinated? In doubt and unbelief. They're just marinated in doubt and unbelief. And they just sit and they soak and they soak up the junk. But if we would worship God and get us in his presence and just soak, just let him soak us through. Amen? But that takes more than 10 minutes. It's going to take you some time to get your mind and your emotions and your flesh settled down and to shut up and be quiet. Because we're always on the go. We're, we're a fast-paced society. And it's hard to shut up, be still. I'm talking to God now. And it may take you a while to transition. And then after you transition, stay a while. Right? Amen. Brothers and sisters, the glory of God is coming into the church. We've got to get ready. We've got to get ready. We've got to have the blood in our lives. We've got to make a big deal about the blood because it is. We need to plead the blood. We need to sprinkle the blood. We need to magnify the blood because only the blood can prepare us. And then we need to praise. We need to worship. We need to pray. We need to fast. We need to intercede. But only as a response to what the blood has done in our lives. Amen. Brothers and sisters, you're looking at a pastor. The blood is doing a work in me. The blood is sanctifying me. Amen. It's changing me. It's rearranging me on the inside. The precious blood of Jesus is working in me. To sanctify me from and to set me apart unto. Amen. Are you hungry for the glory? Amen. It's coming. And when it comes, it's going to come whether we're ready or not. Because we're out of time. We're out of time. Don't be like Ananias and Sapphira. Don't be in the middle of an outpouring of God and miss it. We have a very, very small window of opportunity to get ready. Amen. Because it's going to be like this, and then it's going to be different. And we'll never go back. And when it happens, you don't want to be, I wish I had gotten ready. I wish I had taken care of that area of my life. You want to go with the rest of us and go, oh, hallelujah, the land that flows with milk and honey. Amen. Thank you for listening to the voice of faith today and being a part. We appreciate it very much. Until next time, we gather around the good word of God. Remember these words, be not afraid, only believe.